Okay, Dr. Tinker, I'll start with you. Can you paint the big picture for us? Because I feel like in a lot of these conversations, um, we immediately get into very nuanced and complex specifics. Can you paint the picture for us in terms of um, global energy mix, U.S. energy mix, what is the what amount is fossil based, um, and and how long has it taken for us to get to where we are? I'm not going to say yes or no. <laughs> it's more complicated than that. <laughs> uh, you know, energy is an interesting subject and underpins everything. So it underpins modern societies, and it always has, from wood and coal and hay up to what we have now. And it transitions slowly because it requires a lot of infrastructure. So you see changes that don't happen quickly, and there's a good reason for that. Um, but without energy, as has been said here several times now, we are hungry and naked in the dirt. And unfortunately, in my work, particularly in the last two years, I've traveled to Kenya and Ethiopia and Nepal and Vietnam and Colombia and where people are hungry and naked in the dirt. And today, about two billion people that live like that today. So this subject, this energy subject is one that involves more than just the politics, but it involves human beings and it involves lives and it involves how we treat one another. And, and it involves impact on the environment. You can't do big things today with 7.6 and growing billion people without impacting the environment. And I think the, the challenge is there's a conversation now that's somewhat polarized. You're either about the environment or you're about energy and the economy, but really you have to be about both and all three when those come together, that overlap space. So I call it the radical middle. I've written about that, this overlap space between the energy, the environment, and the economy, how they play together. And it's complicated. You have to look at data. You're not always going to be right. You have to compromise. Um, but that's where the big challenges lie. And, and that's where it's fun if you're willing to get into that space. Absolutely. Well, thank you. And Dr. Pizer, could you talk a little bit more about this, this interplay when we are talking about energy and the economy and the environment? Um, how is it that we can make this case that using fossil-based energy is actually good for the environment? Well, you have to remember that um, before we had fossil fuels, we had wood or whales, oil from whales. They were almost... Um, hunted to extinction for their uh, oil. Um, and also you can see that with the uh, introduction of fossil fuels, first coal, then oil, gas, um, the environmental footprint uh, was reduced dramatically because obviously, or nuclear, uh, for a single power plant, you can generate as much energy as you would need uh, thousands of... Um, Wind farms, but let me get back to your first question about the kind of global mix and the global um, kind of energy outlook, because that's very important for Americans to understand. If they don't understand that, they really might get it wrong, just like we in Europe are currently getting very wrong. It doesn't really matter very much what the Americans are doing energy wise. Seriously, and I'm serious, whether you have a Republican president or a Democrat in the White House, you might have, you know, uh, a period of higher energy prices with a Democrat or lower energy prices with a Republican. It doesn't matter because what is happening currently in the world is we have the biggest economic push the, the world has ever seen. We, we are raising billions of people out of poverty. Uh, we are seeing hundreds of millions of people, particularly in Asia, moving into a middle-class kind of uh, living standard. Whatever Europe or the U.S. does is completely irrelevant to the global energy outlook. And if you look at the last report by the International Energy Agency, they are predicting that by 2040, the global energy mix, which is roughly, roughly 80%, of, of the global energy mix is fossil fuel based, roughly. By 2040, it will be more or less the same. 
And they are predicting that Europe and the US will reduce fossil fuels and increase renewables, will be totally overwhelmed by the new fossil fuel powered generation, which will come online in the rest of the world, particularly in the developing world. So whatever the US does, whatever Europe does, is completely irrelevant to the global picture. So uh, I'm glad you brought up the global picture because however you look at it, um, energy development and use will continue to grow and expand. Um, one of the things you often hear from the other side is, is um, I, I would characterize it as, as fear-mongering, so to speak, but um, that, that peak oil or peak natural gas, that we are one day going to run out of these resources, and if we today um, don't figure out what the, what the replacement is to that, we're going to be left in a really bad situation. Could, could you speak a little bit to that? Well, I, I mean, this is a very embarrassing uh, assumption, and I think the, the congressman mentioned the, that, you know, 10 years ago, everyone was concerned about we're running out of gas and we're running out of oil. We hear more new discoveries of oil and gas every day around the world. More and more countries are looking in particular in Africa, they are now opening the whole continent to oil and gas exploration. They're inviting investors. So, you know, if, if Europe stops exploring oil and gas um, or if the U.S. Uh, were ever to decide to slow down their exploration, other countries will just go ahead. There is more oil and gas now available internationally than 100 years or 50 years ago. It's the opposite of peak oil. We are discovering more oil and gas than we are using. So, Dr. Tinker, um, you've done extensive work, you alluded to it, going into some of these third world countries and exploring what is it like today? A lot of us can't relate to it. What is it like to live today um, in a world that you don't have access to a reliable source of electricity? Perhaps you're living in some measure of serious poverty. You, you've um, been a part of a film called, called Switch On, um, or Switch. If you could talk a little bit about that and um, just what's your experience and how do you convey um, what is going on in places like that to people who are living either in Europe or the United States and make us appreciate something that, frankly, we all take advantage of. Sure. Yeah, it's uh, for those who can, I'll be speaking about this at lunch and show some data and graphs and things, but Switch was about global energy. Energy was the star, and we went to where there was energy, 11 countries and 50s, you know, interviews. Ernie Moniz is featured throughout it and many other prominent folks. Uh, 20 site visits. And what we learned there was that energy underpins everything as we knew. But it's interesting when you look at it more broadly. We don't all have the same resources. So Texas has good wind. Some would say hot air, you know, but we have both. Um, it, but but uh, not everybody does. Some places have great solar. Some have good geothermal, etc. Some have oil and gas. So the resources vary. You can't prescribe something. Um, geographically to everyone. But we learned that energy matters. And, and then what, we've, what we also saw is the last five years, and I've been speaking about this around the world, is about three billion people we left out of that film, those without much energy or, or any at all. And it doesn't just affect the energy impoverished, or you know, some call it energy inequality. Um, it affects us all. Because what happens is the first thing that when you get a 40 watt solar panel on your roof, on a metal roof in Maasai country in Kenya or in the Arwako village of Gunchukwa in Colombia is you get a cell phone. That's the first thing people get. I've seen it over and over and over again. And so they're now communicating and they know some for the first time what the world is. A little different than they thought. So communication, which is allowed by a 40-watt panel, um, creates uh, the reality of inequality that exists. Um, the economy grows because of energy. It's a very strong relationship. So what starts to happen? People begin leaving where they are. They feel like they have no hope. And these are the poor parts of the world. And so you see immigration and migration challenges related to that. 
it's the women who are going for the water that are cooking indoors with wooden dung, the women who are not getting to go to school like their male counterparts. It severely disadvantages women disproportionately over men. Energy inequality does. It affects medicine and health care. The things you would expect, you know, lights for you know, clothing and food and housing. But these bigger issues and bigger challenges are, are what are impacted. So if you start to address energy poverty or energy inequality, you, you really begin to change the world in a positive way. That means we need energy. And there's plenty of energy in the world, but, but it's not all... I was in the oil and gas business for 17 years. I was raised in that business and still quite engaged. There's a lot down there, but it doesn't mean it's an active reserve or it's producible today. So you see huge swings in oil and gas price, and we will see those again. This concept of abundance is one that I've heard before, and I will hear again. It's abundant, but it's not necessarily producible at today's prices, or today's policies, or today's public perception. Okay, so you're going to see tension in the oil and gas world again, and, that, and price will swing back up, and then you'll see bad money come in, et cetera, et cetera. So it'll go through these cycles. Interestingly enough, when you go to scale, everything does that. Just last week, wind in Germany is going through a major layoff, just like the gas business. And, and you see tension as you go to scale in a local geopolitical area because of supply and demand. And so that kind of volatility exists in energy. It will always exist in energy. I think we can mitigate that by not talking, I apologize, about the other side. That just drives me nuts. Okay? I think we all want the same things. We just have different approaches to it. And, and, and so how do you... How we go about that is what matters to me. How we go about addressing major environmental impacts, not just climate change, but the use of land, the, use, the impact to air, local air, the use of water, and the economy. You know, there's, there's, there's ways to go about that, I think, that are more likely to have an impact and work, and those are what I talk about quite a bit. But it requires everybody playing. If we want to stay on our sides and be righteous and proud, we can. We can continue to do it. How's it working? I think I, okay. I think that's a very good that is a very good point, um, Dr. Pizer. Um, if you I know you had some comments, do you want um, yeah, to add anything to that? I'm afraid I I must slightly disagree on the assumption that we all want the same thing. Uh, I mean, I come from Europe, and it's clear that the Europeans don't want the same thing. They don't want coal. They don't want oil. They don't want gas. And that's just for starter, never mind nuclear energy. They want basically the, the kind of political class in Europe think they can power the continent with solar and wind, basically. So they are um, experimenting on a grand scale with energy policies that are essentially destroying their own economic foundation. And we are seeing the, the, the first signs of this now. Um, their idea in Europe was that they would be the kind of um, world-leading technology producers of solar panels. Um, they somehow forgot to, to uh, consider that China can produce them much cheaper. So China flooded the European market with solar, solar panels. The solar industry in Europe went bankrupt. Now they think they can um, win the, the, the battle over electric cars. Of course, the Chinese can produce them for half the price, and they're already beginning to export their electric cars to Europe, basically facing the European car industry is facing an existential crisis because they don't know how to produce cheap electric cars. And um, so on the energy issue, there is a culture war an energy war about where we are going. And part of the reason why we have this battle is that there is a very strong um, campaign and movement saying we are facing 
uh, Armageddon in, in 12 or 20 years. And unless we move away from fossil fuels, the end is nigh and we'll face the end of the world. And if you face these kind of arguments, you have to stand up. You saw, you know, uh, your, your, your policymaker struggling a little bit with the question, you know, what are you doing to save the planet? Well, I'm driving a hybrid. That doesn't save the planet if you ask, you know, AOC. Um, so you have to have a clear idea how you counter these kind of scaremongering um, movements in a realistic way. And I, I'm afraid um, you need to make clear to your, you know, to your audience here in the U.S., uh, if you don't want to destroy your economy, don't follow the European model uh, and look around the world and see what the rest of the world does. Because if you don't, the rest of the world will basically overtake you in 10, 20 years. I mean, the Chinese economy is already bigger than the American economy. The Indian economy will be bigger than the American economy in 10 years' times. And if the U.S. doesn't uh, watch out, it will be relegated. Yeah, and, I, and look, I agree with what you just said. Um, so let me be a little more clear. Uh, I think we want the same things in terms of clean water, uh, clean soils. Um, I think we w want clean air. And we don't want extremes and storm intensity and whatever else climate change could cause. And we want our kids to be able to get educated and be better than we were. So how we go about that matters. I agree completely. Nothing frustrates me more than the conversations about energy that are uninformed. Um, it's a, we allow and encourage climate science to be done by climate scientists, but we let anybody be an energy expert. And we all know we are, except most of us don't know where gasoline comes from, how electricity is really made, but we think we do. And that's the great dilemma, because we vote. Okay. And that's, that's the dilemma of energy. But we actually need to listen to our energy scientists when it comes to solutions for climate change. And my talk today is called The Political Paradox of Sustainable Energy. Because the solutions for climate change are not what those who are most passionate about climate want. It's not what their voter base wants. It won't solve climate change, if indeed it's at CO2 and methane emissions. So how do you address these things in an energy sensible way? And that's, that, it's solvable. The nice part about it, it's not, it's not, it's pretty simple, it's not easy, but it's fairly simple, okay? And I think that's, that's where the conversations that allow us to gather in a, in a radical middle and have conversations around some facts and data, but also the stories that of our lives are gonna, are, they are so powerful. And those powerful stories, I think we all engage, and that's what I mean, we want the same thing. So now how do we go about doing it? And I'll show an example of Germany on a slide today with good intentions. I mean, I just simply, have, at 60 years old, I've stopped judging intentions. I just like to look at outcomes. What happened? Can we re Did it work? Is it working? Should we readjust? Should we allow our politicians to change their minds? Or are we gonna accuse them of being flip-floppers? I reserve my right as a scientist to change my mind with more data and more facts, more information. Everybody should have that freedom to do that without being accused of something. Otherwise, we will not be able to grow and evolve. We just put in fence posts and we can't get out of them. Okay, and this is what frustrates, I think, many of us in this, this field, this global field, is the conversations that become entrenched because of the the scenario in which they're set. And that's why I think that true thought leaders can help this happen in a way that isn't, isn't quite so parochial. I, th I think you're exactly right in terms of, one, it's more important to focus on results. What's, what's actually working? Um, that's an important part of the deliberative process that does often get lost in Washington, D.C., because um, People are talking about these issues where they have an inch depth, no, inch depth knowledge and they end up going into these entrenched and defined policy spaces that are totally unhelpful to trying to figure out what does our energy future actually look like. So in talking about that, um, renewables are a part 
of the energy mix today. They'll continue to be a part of it in the future. Um, I, I don't believe that it'll be 100%. Um, there's, there's a lot of physical limitations. Um, could, could I, I guess it's a two-part question. One is, what are some of those physical limitations that, that people need to be honest about, know about, and be honest about? Um, and then number two, what is the realistic future for renewable energy um, the next 10, 20 by 2100 um, timeframes? I'll start, well, Dr. I'll, I'll start with a couple of statements. And if you're engaged by these or pissed off by them, join us at lunch and you know show a little data. But first of all, the, the sun and the wind are renewable, but the panels and the turbines and the batteries to collect them aren't renewable. There's nothing renewable about them. They require mining. If you don't grow it, you mine it. Everything we make to collect the sun and the wind and store it is mined. And they wear out, so we mine them again. So as we go to scale with the sun and the wind, we're going to have a very different environmental challenge. It's the land. It's nature. It's the mining, the manufacturing, and the disposal as they wear out. We're seeing it in Wyoming today. They're burying 900 turbine blades from 300 turbines, cutting them into thirds. And the largest landfill in Wyoming, you know, it's fiberglass. It's not, it's not chemically toxic anyway, but it's a big landfill. In Texas, we have 13,000 turbines. Batteries, electric vehicles. Um, I was surprised by the statement as well, but I'll show data today. But let's electrify half the world's vehicle fleet, 600 and to 650 million vehicles out of 1.3 billion. How many batteries are in a car? How many are in a Tesla S? Not the battery pack. How many batteries about the size of your cell phone? 7,200 in a Tesla S in the floor bed. Let's do 5,000 batteries times 600 million vehicles is 3 trillion batteries. Count to 1,001, 1,002, 1,003 to 3 trillion. It takes 96,000 years to count to 3 trillion. Where are they going to come from? Where are they going to go? In landfill. It's just a different challenge. Energy at scale, that's why density matters. Okay, so renewable energy has a place. Solar and wind, I should say, have a place and other forms, but they have their own challenge at scale. And so density matters. The electric vehicle was here first, and then along came gasoline because it was better. It was more dense. There are other options to that. The fuel cell, LNG, hydrogen, uh, uh, LNG electric vehicles, they all have a, mi a place and a mix in that transportation scene. The same with power generation talked about nuclear a minute ago, and there, there are ways down there, very dense forms of energy. So these matter. The denser, the less impact. Okay, and there are some, you don't have to take my word for it, but there are some environmentalists out there who are pretty sharp. Michael Schellenberger, who's worked in various administrations, has some good TED Talks on this and nuclear. Um, Stuart Brand, the original environmentalist, remember the Whole Earth Catalog? He and I shared a stage and Northeast not many years ago. They thought there'd be fireworks, the geologist from Texas and the environmentalist from San Francisco Bay. We converged on the same solutions and it was very disappointing to the audience of 300, but he's, he's quite passionate about dense energy and dense foods and dense everything because it's better for the environment. So here's the trick on this is energy underpins the environment, underpins the economy, excuse me, energy underpins the economy. The data are very clear on this. You have to have a healthy economy to be able to invest in the environment at scale. Been in 65 countries. The worst environments in the world are where it is poor. They simply can't afford to clean it up. The best are where we are rich. We have the regulations. We enforce them for air and land and water. Yes, we can overregulate, but regulations help. So that little waltz, that little energy, economy, environment waltz is everything. We've got to lift the world up in order to, for poverty, for inequality, but also to clean up the environment.
it's not that complicated. It's just hard to get done. You're exactly right. I think that one of the hardest things to achieve in that context is what is the appropriate level of balance. It's certainly something that um, you know we struggled every day when I was working on regulations at EPA, where the mission is something we can all agree to, but how do you do it in a way to, be, to where it doesn't become an in, inadvertent barrier to that economic growth that is absolutely vital to a clean environment? Um, Dr. Pizer, do you want to do you want to add a little bit on? The you know the, the the renewable energy question and what does it look like um, going into the future? Well, it has two. The, the question has two aspects. One is the technological limitation, and the other is the economic impact. Never mind the because you know these renewables have a footprint often a thousand times bigger than a, a simple. Uh, um, so I'm, I'm not talking about uh, the thousands of birds and bats and so on and so on that is uh, at scale. Um, I want to focus on the technology and on the economy. Retire that one. <laughs> <laughs> so on the, on the technology, in the absence of storage, in the absence of uh, batteries that can store renewable energy, renewable energy cannot power any country 100%. And I, it's just very simple to explain. Uh, renewable energy in particular, I mean, with the exception of hydro, of course, but when we talk about uh, wind and, and solar, um, we can only generate power if there's wind and if there's sun. So, for instance, in, in Germany, uh, which is perhaps one of the most advanced countries uh, in terms of renewable uh, um, development, on a hot, uh, windy day, almost half of the electricity can now be generated by renewable energy. But in a dark, uh, windless uh, winter month, uh, it could be a, a week or two weeks without much electricity. So what do you do then? If you don't have electricity and you have to power, you know, industrial nation, so they have, of course, conventional power plants. So they have, you know, gas and coal and still some nuclear, not much, but they have still. So they basically use the conventional power plants. But let's say they have decommissioned all of them, you know, because they want to phase out nuclear, they want to phase out coal, and they want to phase out gas. So. You have a country like Germany just powered by wind and solar. What happens in those two weeks where there is no wind and um, no sun in the winter happens? Well, it's easy. You import the electricity from your neighbors. The problem is, of course, by 2050 is all the neighbors also only have wind and solar. <laughs> And there is nothing to import because they are uh, struggling to get electricity. So this whole idea of renewables powering an uh, industrial nation is just technologically impossible in the absence of storage. And whether there will be ever a, a technological solution to batteries big enough to store enough energy uh, to power two weeks of, of Germany uh, remains to be seen. So technological, that's the limit. Economically, um, we have the, 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 another problem in that no one is building conventional power plants anymore in, in Europe for the simple reason that they are no longer profitable because they are no longer running 24-7. They are basically used for backup for the periods when you need conventional electricity generation. Can you talk about, the, uh, on that, the backup, how, how does that impact emissions um, when, you, when you run these plants in an inefficient manner and they're used as backup? Well, well, that is part of the problem. These power plants, particularly gas-fired power plants, are actually emitting more CO2 under more renewable scenarios than if you run them 24-7. So uh, there are economists pointing out that if you have these gas-powered, uh, gas-fired power plants mainly for backup for renewables, you will actually end up with an increase of CO2 emissions from these power plants because they are running inefficiently. But m the, the main point here is that they are no longer running economically. So you have to first subsidize the renewables 
Then you have to subsidize the conventional power plants because they're no longer economic. Then the industry comes and says, look, the energy price is so high, we can't actually stay competitive in Germany. So you have to pay us a subsidy too. So basically where you end up is that everything is subsidized. So the renewables are subsidized, the conventional power plants are subsidized, and then the industry comes and says we can't actually compete with China and the rest of the world. We need subsidies too. That's the reality in Europe. So uh, I'll let Dr. Tinker answer this, and then um, we're going to switch to Q&A from the audience. So while he's answering, think about your um, questions you want to ask. I'm going to pass this to you, and then I'll just stand up at the podium and solve this mic issue. Just a quick add-on to that. It, the, the challenge is we hear the cost of renewables have come down, and they're at parity with, and certainly the panel cost and the turbine cost have come down dramatically. Not much headroom, in fact, to go any lower. Then we have something called LCOE, or the levelized cost of energy, or levelized cost of electricity, and that incorporates more things. When you, but when you read the word levelized, you think it's levelizing across the board, but it still doesn't include the cost of transmission and backup. Mm -hmm. And that's why when you go into geopolitical regions and look at the price of electricity at the end to the consumer, it's higher with intermittency for brilliantly described there. Those are the those are the reasons why the whole cost of electricity in Germany is twenty eight to thirty cents a kilowatt hour, somewhere in that range, three to four times here. And we have two X discrepancy in different states in the United States. Um, if it were causing the effect of lowering CO two emissions, that would be interesting because you might be willing to invest in that. But ironically in Germany What's happened, and I'll show the data at lunch, is when, you, when we took with the scare of fracking natural gas down, it was increasing, flattened it, and nuclear from Fukushima Daiichi flattened. Coal had, was, which was declining, started to level again, and even imports from physical coal, wind went up more steeply. So the CO2 decline that was happening actually flattened in Germany while the price went up. You know, brilliant. And so, this is intentions and outcomes, and I, same kind of thing with zero emissions. You know, when you say we're going to be a zero emission state, really? So, no clothes, no food, no home, no cell phone, no car, nothing? Where does your stuff come from? It comes from over there. What's, what's happening over there? How many atmospheres are there? There's one. So if the stuff that I'm using is made over there and we're worried about climate change, it's still going into the atmosphere. Just one atmosphere. It's not a local river. It's not a local stream. So this matters. This zero emissions claim sounds so good, but it's, it's really disingenuous. It's misleading to the public who hear it and say, we, how many would like to be zero emissions? I would. How many would like to be increase the emissions into the global atmosphere if we are zero emissions? Uh, no, maybe not. So let's ask the question correctly, because that's what's happening. Okay, that's what's happening. For the exact reasons described as you can't export zero emissions far enough, maybe extraterrestrially, but on this planet. You can't export it far enough. At some point, somebody's making something. And it's with dense energy. So we have to clean that up. Fossil fuels aren't clean. They are dirty. Whatever that means, and I'll talk about what it means. Guess what? So are solar and wind. It's just a different kind of dirty at scale. They all have impacts on the environment. So what's the right mix, and how do we clean them up? How do we make it better for the things we all want? Cleaner air, cleaner water, better soils, climate change. That's the conversation that needs to go on in a really honest way, an open way, with good stories, stories that catch us, that matter, and they're out there. Absolutely, so I'll open it up if there's any questions from the audience. Jason, we'll start with you. Yeah, there's a mic right behind you. You just. Okay. 
<laughs> you want to use this one? All right, we just repeat it. Challenge with batteries, right? <laughs> okay, uh, Jason Hayes from the Mackinac Center. Uh, you started to talk about uh, environmental impacts associated with using renewable energy and that sort of thing. One of the other, I mean, it's not just emissions related, it's other issues. So the, the keys that I always talk about, Batao, China, the Democratic Republic of Congo, where do we get our lithium? Where do we get our um, cobalt uh, and our rare earth minerals? So either, either one of you, if you want to talk about that, there's more to it than just emissions. We're also exporting a lot of other pollution. Yeah. Again, <laughs> right, so emissions, if your only objective function is atmospheric emissions, you're going to impact other things, just the reality. Um, when you create low density things that capture low density energy, it takes a lot of stuff, not complicated stuff, but a lot of stuff. And that's mining. So batteries themselves, lithium, cobalt, you mentioned, and other cations and anions uh, that are going to be, other metals that are going to be needed to make batteries. Now, John Goodenough at UT just won the Nobel Prize for lithium ion batteries, a brilliant guy. He's, he's just started the second half of his career. He's 97. So <laughs> oldest Nobel laureate ever. But he's working on solid state batteries now which is interesting, you know, a whole different technological change. The, the electric car isn't different from the internal combustion engine car. They're both cars, they just have a different fuel. So the, the, the analogy between the horse and the car and then the, the, the internal combustion and the internal, and that's not an analogy. They're both cars. The car and the horse is different technology. So, so that's, it's really important as we start to think about technological change and impacts, mining, manufacturing, the, the cloud, data centers, consume 3% of the world's electricity now and growing steeply. Every time you fire up a video on your phone, CO2 emissions. More CO2 out of videos now than the global trains times one and a half, just out of video streaming. Okay, Bitcoin. Bitcoin consumes more electricity than Austria, the whole country. Have you ever spent a Bitcoin? What is it? And so the things we're doing have impacts. They have impacts atmospherically, local air emissions. They have impacts on the land through mining, manufacturing, and the disposal. Where's all the stuff go? It matters. We have a lot of stuff in the oil and gas business and coal mining, too. It's got tons of stuff. <coughs> it makes a lot of energy. So we can't pretend like there's a clean and dirty, a good and bad. That's a false a equation. It sounds good, but it, it teaches your kids information that isn't real. We have to look at the reality of these things and then make good decisions based on those realities. Dr. Pizer, you want to add anything to that or move on to the next question? Okay. Do we have another question from the audience? Can you talk a little bit about the Can you talk a little bit about are we learning from these examples like Germany? Because there's, 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 there's enough data now that you can see what appears from the outside looking in, a failed experiment. And California is another one that you could pick on or you can you can see these things failing, but you don't hear anybody talk about those. Is that entering into the debate or the discussion at all? Well, I hope, I hope that um, U.S. policy and lawmakers will actually look at countries that have gone down that path um, faster and, and, and much deeper than um, most of the U.S. Um, because there are lessons to be learned. Um, even the countries themselves are beginning to realize the limitations and the unintended consequences of their policies. 
The biggest impact, apart from the huge rise in energy prices and the economic effect in terms of um, just, just today, um, 3,000 steel workers have been sacked, basically because steel is no longer possible to produce competitively in Europe as the energy price is so much higher than the rest of the world. Again, it's, they, they get some kind of compensation, but it's not enough. It's not good enough. Um, I mentioned the car industry, never mind the, the uh, energy industry. Um, heavy industry, and I can only confirm what was said uh, early on, if you include the CO2 emissions that are imported. So basically, Europe has shifted a lot of production to China and Vietnam and so on, because they're good guys, and then import the products in the, to Europe. If you include the CO2 emissions of these products that are now imported, produced somewhere else, but imported, there is not much reduction in CO2 emissions in Europe going on. But because it's not produced in Europe, they think they are uh, doing the right thing. But, of course, it's CO2 doesn't matter where it's emitted. It goes in the atmosphere. It's totally irrelevant where you produce it. So that is one of the key problems. And, of course, the U.S. could make the same mistake. Uh, I mean, you are fortunate with your shale revolution to, to have this uh, gold mine uh, that produces this cheap energy. Uh, and if you were ever to for, uh, you know, forgave and, and uh, ban their stuff, like Europe is banning fracking, although we have huge shale basins as well. But the, the political class has decided to ban it and to get the you know, gas from lovely China, uh, uh, Russia, right? So if you were to go down that route that Europe has done, then you, you know, shouldn't be surprised if your industry will become less competitive and other countries will simply take advantage of that. Um, the Chinese are burning more coal than the rest of the world together. And their latest decision uh, which was um, reported last week uh, at national level is to downgrade renewable energy and to go full throttle to coal. So they are building more coal-fired power plants. After all, they're sitting on the coal. Why, why import exp expensive energy if you're sitting on cheap energy? They are not... Um, um, they are not asked to do anything according to the Paris Agreement, as we know. Uh, and so they are just doing what is best for China. Now, of course, um, the, the climate campaigners are saying, don't look at what's best for Europe or what's best for the US. You have to think about you know, Armageddon. And there is simply nothing more important than uh, preventing Armageddon, even if you have to sacrifice your economy. And that is the stark choice that voters have, both in Europe and the U.S., to decide whether they want to keep their economy going or they, whether they want to be green virtue signalers without really making much of a difference, as I mentioned before. There's an interesting transition that happens. I'll just tell three quick stories. Um, as we build our economies on coal-powered electricity, which we've all done. We did it. Germany did it. China's doing it. Vietnam is going to do it. They've just announced 50 new coal power plants, 400 megawatts in the next 20 years as they compete with China to make our stuff. Filmed there, you'll see it and switch on. They can't do renewables, really. They, they have the, they've built all the dams they can. It's jungle. It's a long, narrow country. Long, narrow country. And, and so you can't get wind there, and it's, you can't get the sun there it, a little bit, but not to the scales needed. So here comes Vietnam. That's the reality. How do you capture and store the CO2? That has to happen in Vietnam, 100 million people. Come back to Gunchukwa in Colombia, the Arwaco village. We brought first solar there, three and a half kilowatt panel, half what you'd put on your house, to power up seven mud huts with thatch roofs. They've lived that way for 600 years. A light bulb in each of the huts, three ceiling fans, a community center, one refrigerator freezer. A battery stack that my wife and I bought for 15 grand lead acid most modern there are to back up that system so they can run their lights at night when the sun's not out. Now, that'll do that. There are a billion people that live that way. There's nothing. They don't have roads. They don't have 
wires. They don't have pipelines. That's the only way to get electricity there to get started. Fast forward to or come across the world to Ethiopia, 100 million people, one of the most severely impoverished countries in the world, decided on their Blue Nile, which flows north, merged with White Nile to the Nile to Cairo, Egypt, who by colonial law owns the Nile. Ethiopia said, eh, maybe not. Maybe we, maybe we own our own Nile, and they've built the lar one of the largest dams in the world. It's 70% complete, called the GERD, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, with their own money. A lot of corruption, but their own money. And that is a 6.4 gigawatt dam, 16,400 16, megawatt turbines. That's six nuclear reactors. If put a capacity factor on there. Six nuclear reactors. They're wind driven. <laughs> six, nu six nuclear reactors. It would be 10 coal power plants, plus or minus 10,000 wind turbines. Two megawatt onshore with a capacity factor of about 30, 35%. 10,000 turbines, one dam. They both have environmental impacts. But it's very efficient once it's full. There's a lot of impact on the environment upstream and down. It'll power half the country, 50 million people. And they can sell electricity to their neighbors. It's disrupted the balance of power in North Africa. The whole conversation is now changing. Egypt threatened to bomb it. And now they're at the table talking. But these are the solutions to global energy poverty. V scalable ones and, and distributed renewable ones, they both matter. They both are going to have an impact. The point is, it takes a lot of energy to lift up the world, and it's there. How do we do it in a way that we acknowledge matters but keep it clean? That's the, the conversation. Don't this whole conversation that we have to end certain kind of fuels and go to another one is really quite silly. That'd be like saying with food, because it uses water, fertilizers, run off into streams, we're just going to end food. No, we're going to probably clean it up and continue to make sure agricultural practices don't damage the environment. We're not going to end oil and gas and coal. It's just a different food is measured in calories. It's just a different unit of energy. Let's clean them up. Let's add those that can supplement and be good and clean them up too along the way. But let's have the conversation about how to make the environmental impacts of all forms of energy on all forms of the environment better while powering the world. Okay, well, yeah, thank you. Thank, join me in thanking them for a really great panel.